Hello, are you ready for another chapter of Sarah My Story? We're up to chapter five. Those of you who are new to this series, I have many other videos all in order. They've all got numbers on them. And it's a chapter by chapter review of Sarah Ferguson's book, Sarah My Story. Now I don't read the book to you. We just discuss what's in the chapter. And also I just provide little snippets that are relevant to the discussion we're having. Now this chapter is actually called Through the Looking Glass which of course is an Alice in Wonderland reference. And it's really interesting to me that Sarah, even up to her latest podcast, uh, made a lot of Alice in Wonderland references. It clearly, clearly resonates with her. And she always sort of places herself in the role of Alice, this sort of uh, innocent that life happens to as she goes on her adventures. She sort of manages to abdicate all responsibility by being Alice in Wonderland. That's just my opinion anyway. So let's have a look at this. This is when she moved in with Prince Andrew. And when you think about this, prior to the wedding, moving in, actually living with him in his bachelor quarters, that's quite astonishing. I mean, they were prudish back in the day, were they? She didn't have to wait until they got married to move in with him, which I just found quite, quite amazing. And I suppose Megan didn't have to wait to move in with Harry either. Yeah, so, okay, maybe I'm just old-fashioned. <laughs> My new residence was Andrew's old bachelor quarters in the East Wing. Now, she describes the long corridor that sort of lead, led to his apartments, and it was really long, so long that you couldn't actually see the end of it. She describes it being carpeted in a deep red carpet and papered in green silk. Now, Ingrid uh, Seward was actually quoted as saying that it was like a gentleman's club on a wet afternoon, <laughs> quiet, understated, and slightly faded. Now, it's interesting once you get inside the apartments to hear what she has to say. Now, it was all very heavy oak furniture, very uh, manly, very, very manly. Evidently, Prince Charles actually had those rooms prior to Prince Andrew having them. And the only feminine touch was the fact that Diana had actually stayed in there prior to her marriage, but not with Prince Charles. And she had done up the dressing room. And she'd done it up in pink and white. So very, very girly, which sort of doesn't suit Fergie either. And she says that Andrew and her would dine alone and they had this huge mahogany sort of dining uh, table in a separate dining room and they would use that as a desk. You know, they'd go up each one each end and use it as a desk when they needed a desk. And they would use it, obviously, to host marvellous dinner parties. But when it was just them there alone, they used to have a TV tray in front of the television, just like the Queen used to like to do. Now, this is interesting because there's a lot of stuffed animals, she describes it, and teddies on Andrew's bedroom bed and dressing room. Now, this interests me because I made a quite light-hearted reference to that in a video oh, over a year ago now, and I got hammered in the comments by <laughs> people saying, no, Andrew was just having those teddies for Beatrice and Eugenie. And they used to come and stay with him. And, you know, it was cute. And it was just being a good father. Well, I'm afraid that doesn't stack up now because they haven't had any kids yet. They're not even married yet. And he had them on his bed. So they go back way back before the kids. And I'm sorry, I just find it a little weird. Now, we'll describe them courtesy of Sarah. Finally, there was Andrew's bedroom and dressing room, an absolute time warp. Dozens of stuffed animals blanketed the bed while pink teddies hugged each other atop a lamp. Boys' guns and bachelor bits lay all over and I just accepted it all as it was. So she didn't try to change anything. She figured, oh, well, you can sit on the couch and have a glass of wine and it doesn't worry you either way. She said that her apartment faced out onto the Queen Victoria Memorial and, uh, you know, looked up the mail. So, oh, she said that the clatter from the changing of the guard made phone calls impossible. Wouldn't it be marvellous? Wouldn't it be marvellous to be able to look from the inside out and see the trooping the colour? Now, it's not trooping of the colour, I know, trooping the colour. 
Wouldn't it be marvellous to see that? Just to have that perspective, that different angle, rather than the touristy angle. I think that would be amazing and you'd be able to feel the atmosphere because you would be so close. It would just be marvellous. So Sarah's first official engagement happened in April on Daffodil Day, the Queen's birthday, and she was slightly panicked and moaned to Andrew, what do I say? What do I do? And Andrew, who was trained from birth, said, oh, you'll learn. Now that's not helpful, Andrew. I can't stand Damn, people like that. Look, honestly, <laughs> reading this book, I really am seeing that Prince Andrew was a bit of a lemon. Definitely, I know everyone knows he's a lemon now, but I really think he was a bit of a lemon. When it came to supporting Sarah, he just seemed to be rather vague and rather fumbly and rather, oh, well, it'll all work itself out. But really, he just left us stranded a lot of the time. So she was so used to hiding her feelings from her mother and being resilient and, and sort of brave all the time, and that's why she was such a mess and landed all the problems on her girlfriends and everything. I just think she sucked it up and sort of tried to get along, and eventually it all came crashing down. So she stood on the palace balcony and this was one of her first sort of outings onto the balcony and she said a funny thing. She said a good technique for the royal wave was to pretend to screw a light bulb. <laughs> it was all the wrist. They do that weird wave. They don't go like that because they don't want their chicken wings to flap. So they go like that to stop the chicken wings flapping. It's actually quite clever but does look a little weird. I mean, who waves like that? Nobody. Because they, often they have, way past when it was attractive actually, I did notice that a lot of royal women wear, wore sort of strappy ball gowns and often they would wear these strappy ball gowns out onto the balcony because it would be some, you know, state occasion or something and you could see a bit of the old flappy flappy. <laughs> so that's why they, I can't talk. I would have literally <laughs> going like that. It would be horrible. Mine are like fans. You can fan yourself with mine. So she said that there was no coyness in her, no holding back. She could see in her face in photographs he took of her that he, her eyes would widen with love when she looked at Andrew. Andrew was my knight, my brilliant one. For the first time in my life, I felt secure. So the newspapers were just besotted with her. Fergie mania continued. They, t they said she was a breath of fresh air. Said the same thing about Meghan Markle, didn't they? A breath of fresh air. At 26 years old, I was inc incredibly gullible and naive. Worst of all, I believed my own press. I believed it when they said I was wonderful, fresh, clean page for the royal family. The great, fun Fergie. So we're sort of heading down now to the stag night, the hen's night. Now, I was really interested to read in this book that Andrew had a stag night and Elton John and Sir David Frost were invited. Now, it's interesting that we all know the stories about Fergie and Diana dressing up as police women, and we also know that they did it with Pamela Stevenson, who is Billy Connolly's wife. But the funny thing is in this book, Fergie doesn't name her. Doesn't name her. And I can't work that out because it, she clearly appeared in all the newspaper articles. Do you think that by the time this book was written, that Pamela Stevenson had actually distanced herself from Fergie and said, please don't mention me in your book? I wonder, because it's highly unusual. It just says, uh, as a fallback, Diana and I staged a hen night with a few co-conspirators in tow. And she said that we pretended to arrest one of our friends chosen for her fabulous legs. Now, I'm thinking that was Pamela Stevenson, who was playing the promiscuous lady. Now, the duty police at the gates thought it was all very strange, didn't know who they were and actually arrested them. And they ended up in the back of a van. <laughs> Diana actually asked the police officers for some crisps that were on their sort of dashboard of the van. And they handed them back. And then they sort of cottoned on after a bit of a ride down the road where that we heard one of the policemen say, oh, my heavens, it's the Princess of Wales in drag. Well, of course, she wasn't in drag. She was just dressed up as a policewoman. That doesn't say a lot about policewomen, does it? <laughs> what an awful thing to say. 
No, she was just uh, just dressed up as a police woman. So they get dropped off at Annabelle's and they had to actually talk their way in because the nightclub didn't want a couple of coppers in there. They thought that it might sort of put off some of their patrons. They said that their patrons came to have a good time and they didn't really want to see police officers in there, but they talked their way in. And it's funny that there was actually executives from the Daily Mail standing shoulder to shoulder with them at the bar. So they drank an orange juice and had a dance and whatever. But when they left about two o'clock, they did wild things. They were stopping traffic in Barclay Square. They were, they even tried to get to the palace gates and they, well, they did get to the palace gates and they actually shut them knowing that Prince Andrew was driving home after his stag night, which actually proves that he doesn't drink. And uh, he got frightened when he saw the gates shut and he sort of threw his car into reverse and went driving off because he thought it was a stitch up because he'd rung ahead asking for the palace gates to be open and they had rather, you know, naughtily closed them and he really got frightened. He really did get frightened. So that sort of backfired a bit. But Fergie says that later, I confessed our hen night to the Queen and she thought it was reasonably amusing. We got away with it clean. I'd been as naughty as I could be, and I was still adored by all. I could do no wrong. Now, that was dangerous. That was a very dangerous concept that she sort of gathered there. Now, Jean Rook of the Daily Express wasn't a fan and actually called Fergie at that time an unbrushed red setter struggling to get out of a hand-knitted potato sack. (laughs) Now, Burke's is not very nice. Burke's peerage actually acknowledged the fact that Sarah actually probably had a little bit more blue blood than maybe Andrew even. <laughs> they went way, 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 way back. Now, as her wedding day approached, um, she said that she really lost weight because she was in, she was undergoing the royal wedding day diet in that she was just so busy. It was just a constant frenzy. She was being called upon all the time. She was actually doing official engagements, but she was having to do a lot of dress fittings and she was having to do a lot of thank you letters to do with the presents and she was having to get her photograph taken and she was having to go and inspect the presents and do all the right things. So she was sort of doing royal things. And so from seven in the morning till late at night, she was on the go. She was sort of in the public eye and she was not eating. And that's why she managed to look so gorgeous on her wedding day because I think she did look lovely. I think that dress was stunning, absolutely stunning. I loved it. So presents poured in from all over the world, 2,000 by the end, and they were stored in the palace ballroom, and she says for American readers, which is roughly the size of Madison Square Garden. Now, there's beautiful, beautiful photographs, you know, in the middle of the book, and I will actually take photographs of some of them and put them up for you as we read the few next little bits. They're quite lovely, quite lovely photographs. So on July 21st, two days to go and counting, my father and stepmother threw a brilliant dinner and dance for us. The following night, I stayed at Clarence House, the Queen Mother's residence, as per wedding eve tradition. Now, she was really lonely and she was all alone and she regrets not inviting friends in to be with her the night before the wedding. And she says that she was served this really awful wine in a silver decanter and it was just disgusting. And she said she was used to good wine from Paddy who had the, you know, the best Bordeaux. So she guzzled it down anyway and she said, all night I heard the people camped outside my window, less than sober themselves, screaming, Fergie, Fergie, Sarah, Fergie. Now she only slept for two hours. It's not easy to sleep with people calling your name. That would have been awful. I awoke before seven with a fuzzy sight in my right eye and she actually felt the start of a killer migraine. Now, that is not what you want on the morning of your wedding, but she managed to take her pills in time and that's good. So by the time the hairdresser came and the makeup artist came and they were getting, squeezing her into that beautifully boned corset of her beautiful wedding dress, um, it was a dull throb. So, but oh, I feel for her at that moment. There's nothing worse than having a headache. So she mentions that Andrew was given the title of the Duke of York, which actually after her wedding, then she would become the Duchess of York. 
A few minutes after 11, the gates of Clarence House swung open to release a matched pair of bay horses and their special freight, the glass coach, so named for the large windows on either side. There were but two passengers, myself and my father, who looked dashing in his own father's dark green morning coat. The crowd outside loosed into a raucous version of Here Comes the Bride. It's not very nice. Here comes the bride all fat and wide. Don't think I'd want to hear that either. <laughs> we made our ceremonious way along the mall to Westminster Abbey. Now there was a million people lining that one mile route. So that's amazing. And there she was, she said, cruising and screwing the light bulbs <laughs> right, left and centre. She said it was hard not to enjoy the mass adoration. The tricky part is understanding that it has nothing to do with you. Well, I don't think she did realise it had nothing to do with her at that stage. Now, they got to the Abbey's West store, and this is what Dad said to her as she lifted her satin slipper ready to go into the Abbey. Let the horse take the strain. Trot on, old girl. He meant it as a joke. Did I look like a horse then? But then I thought of how nervous he must be. It's all right, dads, I said, and we were off. Well, of course she knew that he was joking. That's a bit precious, isn't it? I mean, that's the way he spoke. He was known for it. All I could think about was my perfect groom awaiting me with pride, so fantastically good-looking in his gold-braided uniform, sword hung at his side. No one could possibly disprove of me this day with this man. Now, it's interesting, I didn't realise that, that after her wedding, in the order of royal precedence, she actually outranked, at that point, Anne and Margaret. She stood forth behind the Queen, the Queen Mother and the Princess of Wales. I had no idea. So they go back for the reception or the wedding breakfast, as it's called, and she was really disappointed because it was very stuffy, very boring. There weren't any toasts because evidently that is not the done thing at royal wedding breakfast. And she didn't even get to sit next to Andrew. She was between um, Prince Philip and King Constantine of Greece, which I know he was a lovely man, but wouldn't you want to sit with your husband? That was just sort of a bit dull, really. So she regretted that. She missed all the sort of happy wedding family fun sort of aspect of being married. Now, this is where, again, where I think that Andrew was a little bit remiss because they went upstairs to put on their honeymoon clothes and Sarah got changed really quickly. But Andrew was taking his time because he was stalling because he wanted to see the official photographs and he wanted to choose the ones that he wanted to sort of get put in the paper. Now, this took an hour and a half for the photographs to arrive. And when they finally went downstairs, all the guests were looking really fed up, really bored. Lots of people chucked her filthy looks. And she felt, and particularly the royal family, thought that she'd taken an hour and a half to get changed, to get dressed, and they blamed it on her. And Prince Andrew didn't make it clear that he was waiting for the photographs. So she sort of took the fall for that. And she said she felt like yelling over the back of her shoulder, it wasn't me, I got dressed really quickly, it was Andrew. But she didn't. And so she got the blame for that. And she got lots of sort of disapproving looks as she descended the stairs. So the first night of their honeymoon, they were on the Royal Yacht Britannia. And it was surreal because they had the Royal Marine Band marching up down in below, the deck below, playing Chattanooga Choo Choo and Pennsylvania 65000. And <laughs> that's not very romantic, is it? It was the full Royal Marine Band while they were trying to have their first romantic dinner. And then every night they were going to have five nights alone and every night after that Andrew actually invited the ship's officers to join them because that's what mummy did. So Sarah tried to have a good time. She tried to go water skiing and Rear Admiral John Garnier actually took her around the yacht and it was a really rainy day and it wasn't really the best day to go water skiing. And as they came around the corner of the yacht, she hit a giant swarm of jellyfish and they all whipped around her legs and she let out the F word. What the mm, happened, she howled. And 
<laughs> Rear Admiral said he didn't think a princess was meant to swear quite so badly. But gee, that would have hurt. It would have hurt. So just a few days, five days off the Portuguese coast they had together, right? Supposedly romantic. Then they had to swing by and pick up the rest of the royal family and head off to Balmoral. And Sarah says that there was photographs of her in an awful dress with fluffy white bits everywhere and this huge hairdo and red face looking literally like a baked potato. And she says she noticed in the film she watched of it that everything Andrew did, she did. She copied his every movie. If he smiled, she smiled. If he waved, she waved. If he turned around, she turned around. So it's like this Simon Says copycat thing because she just lost all confidence and she was just, you know, so eager to do the right thing and to be approved of. Um, so she said if she'd been scouting for signs of coming trouble, she might have noticed that she'd been booked to spend three times as long with Andrew's family than with him on her honeymoon. So off they went to spend 15 nights at Balmoral with the Queen and Prince Philip and others. And she had five nights, a measly five nights with her husband and hardly any time alone. So I guess she's probably thinking, oh dear, at this point. Although she did say she was really looking forward to going to Balmoral because as you know, she loves horse riding. She loved the fresh air. And I think she also really enjoyed her relationship with the Queen. So I guess, um, I think Sarah went around making older women uh, mother figures. I just have that feeling. And I think she was really keen for the Queen to become a mother figure to her as well. I must look up to see if Princess Diana and the then uh, Prince Charles actually were at Balmoral that year because that would be interesting, it would be really interesting, or whether they avoided it. Anyway, let me know what you've got to say about it all down below, and I can't wait to see you next time. I will leave a link down below for the entire series, so that if you're just new to this video, if you're joining this week, you can go back and catch up with all the other ones. Anyway, see you again soon. Bye.